Chapter 2 of Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tom Cosby. Fifty Years in Chains, or The Life of an American Slave, by Charles Ball. Chapter 2 some short time after my wife became chambermaid to her mistress it was my misfortune to change masters once more levin ballard who as before stated had purchased me of the children of my former master jack cox was successful in his lawsuit with mr gibson the object of which was to determine the right of property in me and one day whilst i was at work in the cornfield mr ballard came and told me i was his property asking me at the same time if i was willing to go with him i told him i was not willing to go but that if i belonged to him i knew i must we then went to the house and mr gibson not being at home mrs gibson told me i must go with mr ballard i accordingly went with him determining to serve him obediently and faithfully. I remained in his service almost three years, and as he lived near the residence of my wife's master, my former mode of life was not materially changed by this change of home. Mrs. Sims spent much of her time in exchanging visits with the families of other large planters, both in Calvert and the neighboring counties and through my wife i became acquainted with the private family history of many of the principal persons in maryland there was a great proprietor who resided in another county who owned several hundred slaves and who permitted them to beg of travelers on the highway this same gentleman had several daughters and according to the custom of the time kept what they called open house that is his house was free to all persons of genteel appearance who chose to visit it the young ladies were supposed to be the greatest fortunes in the country were reputed beautiful and consequently were greatly admired two gentlemen who were lovers of these girls desirous of amusing their mistresses invited a young man whose standing in society they supposed to be beneath theirs to go with them to the manor, as it was called. When there, they endeavored to make him an object of ridicule in presence of the ladies, but he so well acquitted himself and manifested such superior wit and talents that one of the young ladies fell in love with him and soon after wrote him a letter, which led to their marriage. His two pretended friends were never afterwards countenanced by the family as gentlemen of honor but the fortunate husband avenged himself of his heartless companions by inviting them to his wedding and exposing them to the observation of the vast assemblage of fashionable people who always attended a marriage in the family of a great planter the two gentlemen who had been thus made to fall into the pit that they had dug for another were so much chagrined at the issue of the adventure that one soon left maryland and the other became a common drunkard and died a few years afterwards my change of masters realized all the evil apprehensions which i had entertained i found mr ballard sullen and crabbed in his temper and always prone to find fault with my conduct no matter how hard i had labored or how careful i was to fulfill all his orders and obey his most unreasonable commands yet it so happened that he never beat me for which i was altogether indebted to the good character for industry sobriety and humility which i had established in the neighborhood i think he was ashamed to abuse me lest he should suffer in the good opinion of the public, 
for he often fell into the most violent fits of anger against me and overwhelmed me with coarse and abusive language he did not give me clothes enough to keep me warm in the winter and compelled me to work in the woods when there was deep snow on the ground by which i suffered very much i had determined at last to speak to him to sell me to some person in the neighborhood so that i might still be near my wife and children but a different fate awaited me my master kept a store at a small village on the bank of the patuxet river called b although he resided at some distance on a farm one morning he rose early and ordered me to take a yoke of oxen and go to the village to bring home a cart which was there saying he would follow me he arrived at the village soon after i did and took his breakfast with his storekeeper he then told me to come into the house and get my breakfast whilst i was eating in the kitchen i observed him talking earnestly but low to a stranger near the kitchen door i soon after went out and hitched my oxen to the cart and was about to drive off when several men came round about me and amongst them the stranger whom i had seen speaking with my master this man came up to me and seizing me by the collar shook me violently saying i was his property and must go with him to georgia at the sound of these words the thoughts of my wife and children rushed across my mind and my heart beat away within me i saw and knew that my case was hopeless and that resistance was vain as there were near twenty persons present all of whom were ready to assist the man by whom i was kidnapped i felt incapable of weeping or speaking and in my despair i laughed loudly my purchaser ordered me to cross my hands behind which were quickly bound with a strong cord and then he told me that we must set out that very day for the south i asked if i could not be allowed to go to see my wife and children or if this could not be permitted if they might not have leave to come to see me but was told that i would be able to get another wife in georgia my new master whose name i did not hear took me that same day across the patuxet where i joined fifty-one other slaves whom he had bought in maryland thirty-two of these were men and nineteen were women the women were merely tied together with a rope about the size of a bed cord which was tied like a halter round the neck of each but the men of whom i was the stoutest and strongest were very differently caparisoned a strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock round each of our necks a chain of iron about a hundred feet in length was passed through the hasp of each padlock except at the two ends where the hasps of the padlock passed through a link of the chain in addition to this we were handcuffed in pairs with iron staples and bolts with a short chain about a foot long uniting the handcuffs and their wearers in pairs in this manner we were chained alternately by the right and left hand and the poor man to whom i was thus ironed wept like an infant when the blacksmith with his heavy hammer fastened the ends of the bolts that kept the staples from slipping from our arms for my own part i felt indifferent to my fate it appeared to me that the worst had come that could come and that no change of fortune could harm me after we were all chained and handcuffed together we sat down upon the ground and here reflecting upon the sad reverse of fortune that had so suddenly overtaken me 
i became weary of life and bitterly execrated the day i was born it seemed that i was destined by fate to drink the cup of sorrow to the very dregs and that i should find no respite from misery but in the grave i longed to die and escape from the hands of my tormentors but even the wretched privilege of destroying myself was denied me for i could not shake off my chains nor move a yard without the consent of my master reflecting in silence upon my forlorn condition i at length concluded that as things could not become worse and as the life of man is but a continued round of changes they must of necessity take a turn in my favor at some future day i found relief in this vague and indefinite hope and when we received orders to go on board the scow which was to transport us over the patuxent i marched down to the water with a firmness of purpose of which i did not believe myself capable a few minutes before we were soon on the south side of the river and taking up our line of march we traveled about five miles that evening and stopped for the night at one of those miserable public houses so frequent in the lower parts of maryland and virginia called ordinaries our master ordered a pot of mush to be made for our supper after dispatching which we all lay down on the naked floor to sleep in our handcuffs and chains the women my fellow slaves lay on one side of the room and the men who were chained with me occupied the other i slept but little this night which i passed in thinking of my wife and little children whom i could not hope ever to see again i also thought of my grandfather and of the long nights i had passed with him listening to his narratives of the scenes through which he had passed in africa i at length fell asleep but was distressed by painful dreams my wife and children appeared to be weeping and lamenting my calamity and beseeching and imploring my master on their knees not to carry me away from them my little boy came and begged me not to go and leave him and endeavored as i thought with his little hands to break the fetters that bound me i awoke in agony and cursed my existence i could not pray for the measure of my woes seemed to be full and i felt as if there was no mercy in heaven nor compassion on earth for a man who was born a slave day at length came and with the dawn we resumed our journey towards the potomac as we passed along the road i saw the slaves at work in the corn and tobacco fields i knew they toiled hard and lacked food but they were not like me dragged in chains from their wives children and friends compared with me they were the happiest of mortals i almost envied them their blessed lot before night we crossed the potomac at hoe's ferry and bade farewell to maryland at night we stopped at the house of a poor gentleman at least he appeared to wish my master to consider him a gentleman and he had no difficulty in establishing his claim to poverty he lived at the side of the road in a framed house which had never been plastered within the weatherboards being the only wall he had about fifty acres of land enclosed by a fence the remains of a farm which had once covered two or three hundred acres but the cedar bushes had encroached upon all sides until the cultivation had been confined to its present limits the land was the picture of sterility and there was neither barn nor stable on the place the owner was ragged and his wife and children were in a similar plight it was with difficulty 
that we obtained a bushel of corn, which our master ordered us to parch at a fire made in the yard, and to eat for our supper. Even this miserable family possessed two slaves, half-starved, half-naked wretches, whose appearance bespoke them familiar with hunger and victims of the lash. But yet there was one pang which they had not known. They had not been chained and driven from their parents or children into hopeless exile. We left this place early in the morning and directed our course toward the southwest, our master riding beside us and hastening our march, sometimes by words of encouragement and sometimes by threats of punishment. The women took their place in the rear of our line. We halted about nine o'clock for breakfast and received as much cornbread as we could eat together with a plate of boiled herrings and about three pounds of pork amongst us. Before we left this place, I was removed from near the middle of the chain and placed at the front end of it, so that I now became the leader of the file and held this post of honor until our irons were taken from us near the town of Columbia in South Carolina. We continued our route this day along the high road between the Potomac and Rappahannock, and I saw each of those rivers several times before night. Our master gave us no dinner today, but we halted and got as much corn mush and sour milk as we could eat for supper. The weather grew mild and pleasant, and we needed no more fires at night. From this time we all slept promiscuously, men and women on the floors of such houses as we chanced to stop at. We passed on through Bowling Green, a quiet village. Time did not reconcile me to my chains, but it made me familiar with them. I reflected on my desperate situation with a degree of calmness, hoping that I might be able to devise some means of escape. My master placed a particular value upon me, for I heard him tell a tavern keeper that if he had me in Georgia, he could get eight hundred dollars for me, but he had bought me for his brother and believed he should not sell me. He afterwards changed his mind, however. I carefully examined every part of our chain, but found no place where it could be separated. We all had as much cornbread as we could eat, procured of our owner at the places we stopped at for the night. In addition to this, we usually had a salt herring every day. On Sunday, we had a quarter of a pound of bacon each. We continued our course up the country westward for a few days and then turned south, crossed James River above Richmond, as I heard at the time. After more than four weeks of travel, we entered South Carolina near Camden, and for the first time I saw a field of cotton in bloom. As we approached the Yatkin River, the tobacco disappeared from the fields and the cotton plant took its place as an article of general culture. I was now a slave in South Carolina and had no hope of ever again seeing my wife and children. I had at times serious thoughts of suicide so great was my anguish. If I could have got a rope, I should have hanged myself at Lancaster. The thought of my wife and children I had been torn from in Maryland and the dreadful, undefined future which was before me came near driving me mad. It was long after midnight before I fell asleep, but the most pleasant dream succeeded to these sorrowful forebodings. I thought I had escaped my master and through great difficulties made my way back to Maryland and was again in my wife's cabin with my little children on my lap. Every object was so vividly impressed on my mind in this dream that when I awoke, a firm conviction settled upon my mind that by some means, at present incomprehensible to me, I should yet again embrace my wife 
and caress my children in their humble dwelling. Early in the morning, our master called us up and distributed to each of the party a cake made of cornmeal and a small piece of bacon. On our journey, we had only eaten twice a day and had not received breakfast until about nine o'clock. But he said this morning meal was given to welcome us to South Carolina. He then addressed us all and told us we might now give up all hope of ever returning to the places of our nativity, as it would be impossible for us to pass through the states of North Carolina and Virginia without being taken up and sent back. He further advised us to make ourselves contented, as he would take us to Georgia, a far better country than any we had seen, and where we would be able to live in the greatest abundance. About sunrise, we took up our march on the road to Columbia, as we were told. Hitherto, our master had not offered to sell any of us, and had even refused to stop to talk to any one on the subject of our sale, although he had several times been addressed on this point before we reached Lancaster. But soon after we departed from this village, we were overtaken on the road by a man on horseback, who accosted our driver by asking him if his niggers were for sale. The latter replied that he believed he would not sell any yet, as he was on his way to Georgia, and cotton being now much in demand, he expected to obtain high prices for us from persons who were going to settle in the new purchase. He, however, contrary to his custom, ordered us to stop and told the stranger he might look at us and that he would find us as fine a lot of hands as were ever imported into the country, that we were all prime property and he had no doubt would command his own prices in Georgia. The stranger, who was a thin, weather-beaten, sunburned figure, then said he wanted a couple of breeding wenches and would give as much for them as they would bring in Georgia, that he had lately heard from Augusta, and that niggers were not higher there than in Columbia, and, as he had been in Columbia the week before, he knew what niggers were worth. He then walked along our line, as we stood chained together, and looked at the whole of us. Then, turning to the women, asked the prices of the two pregnant ones. Our master replied that these were two of the best breeding wenches in all Maryland, that one was twenty-two and the other only nineteen, that the first was already the mother of seven children and the other of four, that he had himself seen the children at the time he bought their mothers, and that such wenches would be cheap at a thousand dollars each. But as they were not able to keep up with the gang, he would take twelve hundred dollars for the two. The purchaser said this was too much, but that he would give nine hundred dollars for the pair. This price was promptly refused, but our master, after some consideration, said he was willing to sell a bargain in these wenches and would take eleven hundred dollars for them, which was objected to on the other side, and many faults and failings were pointed out in the merchandise. After much bargaining and many gross jests on the part of the stranger, he offered a thousand dollars for the two and said he would give no more. He then mounted his horse and moved off. But after he had gone about one hundred yards, he was called back, and our master said if he would go with him to the next blacksmith's shop on the road to Columbia and pay for taking the irons off the rest of us, he might have the two women. This proposal was agreed to, and as it was now about nine o'clock, we were ordered to hasten on to the next house, where, we were told, we must stop for breakfast. At this place, we were informed that it was ten miles to the next smith's shop, and our new acquaintance was obliged by the terms of his contract to accompany us thither. We received for breakfast about a pint of boiled rice to each person, and after this was dispatched, we again took to the road, 
eager to reach the blacksmith's shop at which we expected to be relieved of the iron rings and chains which had so long galled and worried us about two o'clock we arrived at the longed-for residence of the smith but on inquiry our master was informed that he was not at home and would not return before evening here a controversy arose whether we should all remain here until the smith returned or the stranger should go on with us to the next smithery which was said to be only five miles distance this was a point not easily settled between two such spirits as our master and the stranger both of whom had been overseers in their time and both of whom had risen to the rank of proprietors of slaves the matter had already produced angry words and much vaunting on the part of the stranger that a freeman of south carolina was not to be imposed upon that by the constitution of the state his rights were sacred and he was not to be deprived of his liberty at the arbitrary will of a man just from amongst the yankees and who had brought with him to the south as many yankee tricks as he had niggers and he believed many more he then swore that all the niggers in the drove were yankee niggers when i overseed for colonel polk said he on his rice plantation he had two yankee niggers that he brought from maryland and they were running away every day i gave them a hundred lashes more than a dozen times but they never quit running away till i chained them together with iron collars round their necks and chained them to spades and made them do nothing but dig ditches to drain the rice swamps they could not run away then unless they went together and carried their chains and spades with them i kept them in this way two years and better niggers i never had one of them died one night and the other was never good for anything after he lost his mate he never ran away afterwards but he died too after a while he then addressed himself to the two women whose master he had become and told them that if ever they ran away he would treat them in the same way wretched as i was myself my heart bled for these poor creatures who had fallen into the hands of a tiger in human form the dispute between the two masters was still raging when unexpectedly the blacksmith rode up to his house on a thin bony-looking horse and dismounting asked his wife what these gentlemen were making such a frolic about i did not hear her answer but both the disputants turned and addressed themselves to the smith the one to know what price he would demand to take the irons off all these niggers and the other to know how long it would take him to perform the work it is here proper for me to observe that there are many phrases of language in common use in carolina and georgia which are applied in a way that would not be understood by persons from one of the northern states for instance when several persons are quarreling brawling making a great noise or even fighting they say the gentlemen are frolicking i heard many other terms equally strange whilst i resided in the southern country amongst such white people as i became acquainted with though my acquaintance was confined in great measure to overseers and such people as did not associate with the rich planters and great families the smith at length agreed to take the irons from the whole of us for two dollars and fifty cents and immediately set about it with the air of indifference that he would have manifested in tearing a pair of old shoes from the hoofs of a wagon horse it was four weeks and five days from the time my irons had been riveted upon me until they were removed and great as had been my sufferings whilst chained to my fellow slaves i cannot say that i felt any pleasure in being released from my long confinement 
for I knew that my liberation was only preparatory to my final and, as I feared, perpetual subjugation to the power of some such monster as the one then before me who was preparing to drive away the two unfortunate women whom he had purchased and whose life's blood he had acquired the power of shedding at pleasure for the sum of a thousand dollars. After we were released from our chains, our master sold the whole lot of irons, which we had borne from Maryland, to the blacksmith for seven dollars. The smith then procured a bottle of rum and treated his two new acquaintances to a part of its contents, wishing them both good luck with their niggers. After these civilities were over, the two women were ordered to follow their new master, who shaped his course across the country by a road leading west-west. At parting from us, they both wept aloud and wrung their hands in despair. We all went to them and bade them a last farewell. Their road led into a wood, which they soon entered, and I never saw them nor heard of them again. These women have both been driven from Calvert County, as well as myself, and the fate of the younger of the two was peculiarly severe. She had been brought up as a waiting maid of a young lady, the daughter of a gentleman, whose wife and family often visited the mistress of my own wife. I had frequently seen this woman when she was a young girl in attendance upon her young mistress and riding in the same carriage with her. The father of the young lady died, and soon after she married a gentleman who resided a few miles off. The husband received a considerable fortune with his bride, and amongst other things, her waiting maid, who was reputed a great beauty among people of color. He had been addicted to the fashionable sports of the country before marriage, such as horse racing, fox hunting, etc., and I had heard the black people say he drank too freely, but it was supposed that he would correct all these irregularities after marriage, more especially as his wife was a great belle and withal very handsome. The reverse, however, turned out to be the fact. Instead of growing better, he became worse, and in the course of a few years was known all over the country as a drunkard and a gambler. His wife, it was said, died of grief, and soon after her death, his effects were seized by his creditors and sold by the sheriff. The former waiting maid, now the mother of several children, was purchased by our present master for four hundred dollars at the sheriff's sale, and this poor wretch, whose employment in early life had been to take care of her young mistress and attend to her in her chamber and at her toilet, after being torn from her husband and her children, had now gone to toil out a horrible existence beneath the scorching sun of a South Carolina cotton field, under the dominion of a master as void of manners of a gentleman as he was of the language of humanity. It was now late in the afternoon, but, as we had made little progress today, and were now divested of the burden of our chains, as well as freed from the two women, who had hitherto much retarded our march, our master ordered us to hasten on our way, as we had ten miles to go that evening. I had been so long oppressed by the weight of my chains and the iron collar about my neck that for some time after I commenced walking at my natural liberty, I felt a kind of giddiness or lightness of the head. Most of my companions complained of the same sensation, and we did not recover our proper feelings until after we had slept one night. It was after dark when we arrived at our lodging place, which proved to be the house of a small cotton planter, who, it appeared, kept a sort of house of entertainment for travelers, 
contrary to what I afterwards discovered to be the usual custom of cotton planters. This man and my master had known each other before, and seemed to be well acquainted. He was the first person that we had met since leaving Maryland, who was known to my master, and as they kept up a very free conversation through the course of the evening, and the house in which they were was only separated from the kitchen in which we were lodged by a space of a few feet, I had an opportunity of hearing much that was highly interesting to me. The landlord, after supper, came with our master to look at us and to see us receive our allowance of boiled rice from the hands of a couple of black women who had prepared it in a large iron kettle. Whilst viewing us, the former asked the latter what he intended to do with his drove, but no reply was made to this inquiry, and as our master had, through our whole journey, maintained a steady silence on this subject, I felt a great curiosity to know what disposition he intended to make of the whole gang, and of myself in particular. On their return to the house, I advanced to a small window in the kitchen, which brought me within a few yards of the place where they sat, and from which I was able to hear all they said, although they spoke in a low tone of voice. I here learned that so many of us as could be sold for a good price were to be disposed of in Columbia on our arrival to that place and that the residue would be driven to Augusta and sold there. The landlord assured my master that at this time slaves were much in demand, both in Columbia and Augusta, that purchasers were numerous and prices good, and that the best plan of effecting good sales would be to put up each nigger separately, at auction, after giving a few days' notice by an advertisement in the neighboring country. Cotton, he said, had not been higher for many years, and as a great many persons, especially young men, were moving off to the new purchase in Georgia, prime hands were in high demand for the purpose of clearing the land in the new country, that the boys and girls under twenty would bring almost any price at present in Columbia for the purpose of picking the growing crop of cotton, which promised to be very heavy. And as most persons had planted more than their hands would be able to pick, young niggers who would soon learn to pick cotton were prime articles in the market. As to those more advanced in life, he seemed to think the prospect of selling them at an unusual price not so good, as they could not so readily become expert cotton pickers. He said further that for some cause which he could not comprehend, the price of rice had not been so good this year as usual, and that he had found it cheaper to purchase rice to feed his own niggers than to provide them with corn, which had to be brought from the upper country. He therefore advised my master not to drive us towards the rice plantation of the low country. My master said he would follow his advice, at least so far as to sell a portion of us in Carolina, but seemed to be of opinion that his prime hands would bring him more money in Georgia, and named me, in particular, as one who would be worth at least a thousand dollars to a man who was about making a settlement and clearing a plantation in the new purchase. I therefore concluded that in the course of events I was likely to become the property of a Georgian, which turned out in the end to be the case, though not as soon as I at this time apprehended. I slept but little this night, feeling a restlessness when no longer in chains, and pondering over the future lot of my life, which appeared fraught only with evil and misfortune. Day at length dawned, and with its first light we were ordered to betake ourselves to the road, which, we were told, would lead us to Columbia, the place of intended sale of some, if not all of us. 
for several days past i had observed that in the country through which we traveled little attention was paid to the cultivation of anything but cotton now this plant was almost the sole possessor of the fields it covered the plantations adjacent to the road as far as i could see both before and behind me and looked not unlike buckwheat before it blossoms i saw some small fields of corn and lots of sweet potatoes amongst which the young vines of the watermelon were frequently visible the improvements on the plantations were not good there were no barns but only stables and sheds to put the cotton under as it was brought from the field hay seemed to be unknown in the country for i saw neither haystacks nor meadows and the few fields that were lying fallow had but small numbers of cattle in them and these were thin and meager we had met with no flocks of sheep of late and the hogs that we saw on the roadside were in bad condition the horses and mules that i saw in the cotton fields were poor and badly harnessed and the half-naked condition of the negroes who drove them or followed with the hoe together with their wan complexions proved to me that they had too much work or not enough food we passed a cotton gin this morning the first that i ever saw but they were not at work with it we also met a party of ladies and gentlemen on a journey of pleasure riding in two very handsome carriages drawn by sleek and spirited horses very different in appearance from the moving skeletons that i had noticed drawing the plows in the fields the black drivers of the coaches were neatly clad in gay colored clothes and contrasted well with their half-naked brethren a gang of whom were hoeing cotton by the roadside near them attended by an overseer in a white linen shirt and pantaloons with one of the long negro whips in his hand i observed that these poor people did not raise their heads to look at either the fine coaches and horses then passing or at us but kept their faces steadily bent towards the cotton plants from among which they were removing the weeds i almost shuddered at the sight knowing that i myself was doomed to a state of servitude equally cruel and debasing unless by some unforeseen occurrence i might fall into the hands of a master of less inhumanity of temper than the one who had possession of the miserable creatures before me end of chapter two Recording by Tom Cosby.